Welcome to Little Lectures, making learning and teaching easy for residents and students on the go. Join our residents from the University of Louisville as they share the highest yield internal medicine topics in digestible chunks. Welcome to the Louisville Lectures. Today we're going to be doing a little lecture on hyponatremia. My name is Lisa Scholen and I'm a PGY2 internal medicine resident at the University of Louisville and I'll be talking about hyponatremia today. So to start off, there are three basic categories that we need to be aware of when you're evaluating a patient with low sodium. The first is hyperosmolar, then we have isoosmolar, and then lastly we have hypoosmolar. Predominantly we're gonna talk about hypoosmolar because that's what you're gonna see when patients come into the hospital, but we're gonna to touch base real quick on hyperosmolar and isoosmolar as well, just so you're aware. Hyperosmolar is generally things like high glucose or you know mannitol, pretty much just big particles in the blood that's causing the sodium to artificially appear low. And there's a, actually a pretty quick formula to just be aware of for anybody who has high sugars and that's you know anybody who has a glucose above 100, roughly you want to raise the a sodium level about 1.6 milliequivalents for every 100 above that in order to correct to the right sodium level. And then for isoosmolar, that's really just for historical purposes to mention it. Our labs are all up to date now, and so we really don't have an issue with that anymore. But in the past, you know, things like having really high protein levels or really high lipids could make the sodium again appear falsely low. Moving on to the bulk of the talk, hypoosmolar. Again, three major categories that we can separate those into, and that's based on volume status. So when you think about sodium, you want to think about water as well because the two are very much a unit. So for hypovolemia, you have low sodium and low water. However, the sodium is a lot less to the water, and that's why you get the hyponatremia picture. And there are several different causes for that. So you can think of extra renal and then renal causes. Renal causes being things like diuretics, primary adrenal insufficiency, and then your extra renal causes will be things like GI losses, so vomiting, diarrhea, and then also third spacing. So if somebody has like really severe pancreatitis, for example. Kind of going back on the primary adrenal insufficiency just for a second, that's going to be where you have low cortisol and low aldosterone levels. And so the picture that you'll see with somebody with adrenal insufficiency is they're going to have, they're not going to be able to reabsorb their sodium in the distal tubules. And then they're also going to not be able to excrete potassium and hydrogen. So they're going to have an acidosis and hyperkalemia to go along with that as well. The treatment for anybody with low volume hyponatremia is to give them normal saline, and that'll correct it. Moving on to the next category, we've got euvolemia. So those are the patients who are, they have a normal volume status, however, their sodium, again, is lower in proportion to the water in their body. So this group I like to generally think of as kind of the hormone derangements um, because a lot of them are related to different hormones in the body. So um, this will include things like SIDH, um, hypothyroidism, glucocorticoid deficiency, and then lastly in there you've got things like psychogenic polydipsia. Volume depletion versus SIADH can sometimes be difficult to distinguish. The following table outlines clinical and laboratory findings to help distinguish the two. Patients in a hypovolemic state often have postural blood pressure and pulse changes. Grabbing orthostatics can be beneficial. In a normal functioning kidney, water and salt will be avidly reabsorbed to try and compensate for the hypovolemic and hyponatremic states, respectively. Therefore, you will see highly concentrated urine with a low urine sodium level. However, in SIADH, much more water is reabsorbed in relation to sodium. Urine osmolality in these patients is much lower, and higher quantities of sodium are seen in the urine. Lastly, you can check a serum uric acid level. In SIADH, more water is retained, causing expansion of the serum volume. This, in turn, prevents urate from being reabsorbed at the tubules, which results in an overall lower serum uric acid level. Unfortunately, hypothyroidism and cortisol deficiency, or cortisol deficiency both 
can present similarly to SIDH. So in those patients, you will actually want to grab a TSH and cortisol level just to make sure you rule those causes out before you say somebody has syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. The way to treat these patients is actually to restrict fluids from them. So these people, if you give them more fluids, it will actually worsen their hyponatremia. And then if they have things like low thyroid or low cortisol, then you can um, replace those hormones as well. Lastly, the last category we have is hypervolemia. And so as you can imagine, those people are volume overloaded um, in proportion to how much sodium they have. Most of those cases are things like CHF, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, and then either acute or chronic renal failure can also cause this as well. And the way to treat these patients is to restrict water as well and to give them loop diuretics. And it's very important that it's loop diuretics because thiazide diuretics can actually worsen the patient's hyponatremia as well. And so just a couple last comments to be aware of when you're taking care of somebody with hyponatremia is when you're treating these patients is to be aware of that you're not correcting them too rapidly because that can cause uh, unwanted complication called osmotic demyelination syndrome where all of a sudden the water gets goes out of the cells and all of a sudden you get cell shrinking and, and you cause damage to the nervous system. And so what you want to do is you want to avoid going over the four to six mil equivalents for the first 24 hours that you're treating somebody. And then lastly, there are a couple other therapies such as salt tablets and ADH antagonists such as your Vaptans, but I think that's probably beyond the scope of what you would be expected to know as a medical student, but just be aware that there are other things like that. Also hypertonic saline that you may see patients getting treated with who have more severe forms of hyponatremia in the hospital. Okay, so if there's three things I want you to remember today, the first is to always make sure you assess the patient's volume status. And then if the patient is euvolemic, think of hormone impairments. And then lastly, make sure to be careful so that you do not go above the four to six mil equivalent sodium correction within the first 24 hours. If you have any more questions about hyponatremia, be sure to check out the Big Louisville lecture on hyponatremia. Good luck. Thanks for listening and learning with us. If you would like more information on this topic, please take a look at our full-size Louisville Lectures, either on louisvillelectures.org, on our YouTube channel, or on our podcast. PGY2 resident. You guys start over? Yep. <laughs>